Time now for focus. Learning to live together with respect. That's what the Archbishop of Kirkuk in northern Iraq says his university residence is all about. Among the Muslim, Christian and Yazidi students he hosts are youths who fled Mosul, with efforts continuing to rid the city of Islamic State militants. Eleanor Adri and Orian Verdier sent us this report. Every afternoon, Shahad walks home from class. She lives in this house with about 20 other university students. Hello, Banat. They are Muslim, Christian, Yazidi, and they all come from the Nineveh Plain in Mosul. <laughs> to continue their studies, there is only one solution, to come and live in Kirkuk, the city where the entire University of Mosul was transferred. Here, Shahad was confronted with the unknown. Me and my sister are from Bashika. It's a small town on the northern outskirts of Mosul. We weren't used to meeting new people. At first, my father didn't want us to come to Kirkuk. But we convinced him to let us, even though we were also scared. You know, you can't stop living because of fear. The church of Kirkuk offered us hospitality and security in this house. Thanks to this, we have new sisters, and our fear has gone. Kirkuk has always been home to many different communities, giving it the nickname Little Iraq. Right in the heart of the city is where Bishop Yusuf Mirkis decided to establish his university residence in 2014. Today, it welcomes 700 students of all denominations. I felt that we were in front of a new Iraq, an Iraq of the future. And our project for hosting these students is a small laboratory, a small incubator, to learn how to live together and what distances to keep with each other. This distance must be filled with respect. Abu Duraid is one of the administrators at the residence. The students call him uncle. He supports them with kindness, while making sure they respect certain rules to ensure peaceful coexistence. When students arrive, I tell them, keep your religion in your private space. For now, despite the presence of Muslims, Yazidis and Christians together, we haven't had any major problems. It is important that our students keep their religion private. If they start debating it, they will not agree on it. That is why we do not allow debate. On the other hand, they are free to practice their religion in their rooms and listen to the Quran or any other religious narrative. They put it on their phones and use headphones. Tonight, Abu Duraid is helping to celebrate the 22nd birthday of Shahad's older sister. The young women spent the afternoon cooking for the celebration. But they all know that one day, the good times will come to an end. Thinking about the future worries Shahad. She and her sister are Yazidis, a community particularly persecuted by the Islamic State group. <laughs> One day we will have to go home. Our family has already returned, but I'm not sure we could ever study again in Mosul. Since the arrival of the Islamic State group, the situation is no longer stable, and then we don't have the support of the people of Mosul. Before the arrival of the Islamic State group, my uncle was killed. He was driving a bus to transport all the students from Bashika to the University of Mosul. His only sin was helping young Yazidis get educated. For this reason, he was killed, and nobody did anything. And you, Fatan, do you think you'll be safe in Mosul? I don't think so. Even if I'm a Muslim, I'm not confident. This is even more difficult for Christians and Yazidis. We do not know the difficulties we have to face. Maryam is also a Muslim. 
She fears that her community will face backlash because of Islamic State's actions. Inshallah, I hope the Yazidis will understand that these terrorists distort the Muslim religion. They are fighting on our behalf and ignorant people have joined them. Daesh divided us and reached their goal. Shahad, Maryam and their friends only have a few more months to enjoy this safe haven. The University of Mosul is shattered, so there is no question of an immediate return. Even after it reopens, many students say they prefer to withdraw from school rather than return to Mosul, where they no longer trust their neighbors. For more on this, I'm now joined in the studio by Julien Theron. He's a political scientist specialising in the Middle East. Hello, thank you very much indeed for your time. First of all, I'd like your reaction to that report, the idea of bringing together Iraqi youths of different faiths. What do you make of that? Well, I think that the uh, Arch Archbishop of, of Kirkuk had a, a great idea, actually, because these kind of initiatives are pretty rare. Uh, and it's very interesting because it shows that it is possible. But I think that all Iraqis, at least the oldest ones, uh, know that actually they are able to live all together. Uh, we knew that it was the case before. Uh, it's not necessary to have a strict rule under Saddam Hussein to, to live together, but they actually live together. So I think that nobody doubts that in Iraq. But the problem here is not... The, uh, practical coexistence. The problem is, what about the governance? And this is the main issue, which is not asked in this report, because it, it's not the point, actually. It's regarding to the studies. Uh, but regarding to the communities, there's a lot of stakes, uh, even inside the communities. We always speak about between the Sunni, the Shia, and, and the Kurds. But even among the Shia cycle, for, for instance, in Baghdad, uh, there's a lot of questions about which group, and even inside the party, which group of the party will get the power. Uh, we know that there has been a lot of troubles in the Green Zone, even in the Green Zone, and that the Peace Brigade, the, the movement uh, of uh, the, the cleric, Moqtad al-Sadr, uh, was accused to try to destabilize the government and so on. And they are mainly Shia, both a uh, movement. So uh, that's interesting. And even in uh, Kurdistan, for instance, there's different move political movement inside. One of them, for instance, the PUK, is uh, in control of I'd say something like perhaps a third of the Peshmerga uh, fighters. Uh, another party is coming from the election, the Goran party. I mean, th there's a lot of different stakes inside the communities and among the communities, and sometimes very even more complicated, like, for instance, the Turkmen Shia who joined the Shia uh, uh, militias and so on. So you see that all these complicated puzzles will have to be managed to decide we'll, a governance. We'll talk a little bit about uh, post-Islamic State uh, Iraq in, in a moment, but uh, that's the thing. When we talk about uh, fighting the Islamic State group, it's not as simple as Iraqis as a whole versus the Islamic State group. There, there are locals who sometimes meet, need to be convinced of the good intentions of Iraqi forces coming into their town, for example, at the moment in Mosul. True, true. The Islamic State did not come from anything. I mean, uh, it, you probably know that it was uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq before, or uh, at the country of the two rivers, actually. Um, and actually, at, at, at the time, around 2007, it collapsed. What made Islamic State collapse? The surge, the American reinforcement of troops on the ground, meaning securization of the ground, which is actually happening more or less uh, today. And the other one, and it was dramatically important, was the certainly the, the, the establishment of uh, the Sunni militia, the Sahwa. Uh, it was not a perfect militia. I talked with reporters coming, well, linked to uh, families who had trouble with, with these militias. And so on. it was not perfect, of course. But they were Sunni against Al-Qaeda, which is Sunni too, meaning that they had at least a bit of legitimacy. And what we are seeing today is, is not the same. We are seeing uh, 
very powerful uh, Shia militia. Hopefully they were there to prevent the Islamic State to, to take Baghdad. But now the Turkish citizen, like you, like you said, when they take cities like Ramadi or Fallujah, where they, they arrive usually just after the elite forces of the Iraqi army, well, there has been uh, accusations of, of uh, human rights abuses, meaning that you can't make your rule accepted by the locals if you when you arrive, even if it's understandably in order to take Islamic State's remaining uh, elements or something like that. But I mean, you have to respect the local population, otherwise it, it, it can't be possible. And it, it is not what we are saying, the Sawa, the situation in 2007. So we are not establishing uh, the condition of a post IS stability in Iraq, and when I say post IS, I mean uh, territory, because they they're going to be still there in clandestinity, so it won't be like IS free Iraq. We're running out of time, but just a quick word on the situation in Mosul. So the East was liberated earlier this year. Now they're working on on trying to get rid of uh, the Islamic State group from uh, the West. Uh, when might that wrap up, and what's the plan for after that? You were talking about governance. There has to be a plan then on who's going to take over. Well, I completely agree. There has to be a plan, but there's no plan. There's there's a cell, there's contacts, there's talks. Uh, one of the main questions is the uh, the importance of uh, the Kurdistan uh, autonomous region. Uh, the possibility to go from a federal Iraq to a confederal Iraq, meaning that the Sunni too would have some kind of autonomous parts of the country. But it's not decided, and the pro-Tehran, pro-Iran uh, forces, the, the militia and the political parties, are mainly against that. So th there's actually no plan today, and that's a major issue. The, they're against uh, giving Sunnis a greater say then in the country later on. All right, well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you very much indeed, you. Uh, Julien Thiron, for coming in.